Welcome back to 8701. So in this uh, video, we want to look at experimental studies of neutrino oscillations. The first question is, where do we get the neutrinos? How do we produce the neutrinos? And the answer is, there's numerous sources for neutrinos. Um, you might be lucky and find them in supernova explosions, or if you're really trying hard, we can observe them as relics of the Big Bang. There is a lot of neutrinos as, as the relic of the Big Bang. Um, around us. Problem is that they have very low energies and are difficult to observe. Um, easier so is the use of neutrinos when they're generated in cosmic air showers. Um, there's a lot of neutrinos coming from the sun. Uh, beams, beam lines, um, accelerators can be used but to smash particles into material and then in the decay product produce all the neutrinos. And also reactors, nuclear reactors can be used as neutrino sources. By the way, neutrinos can also be used in order to monitor the nuclear activity around the globe. Okay, studies of uh, neutrino oscillation. So we can make this table here and ask ourselves what kind of, you know, the experimental parameters are the length, the energy, and the sensitivity to specific mass range. So for the solar neutrinos, you know, the distance between the Earth and the Sun is pretty much fixed um, to first order. Um, the energy of the neutrinos coming out is in the order of 1 MeV. We are going to look at a table. And so the, the mass range we can probe is 10 to the minus 10 in uh, delta M square. For atmospheric neutrinos, they are produced in the upper atmosphere, you know, 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 7 meters. Energies can range, have a large range, let's say 10 to the Two to 10 to the 5 MeV. And then reactors, typically MeV range, it's kind of the nuclear range for, for neutrino energies. Um, and the range is given by, you know, how much space do you have, you know, around or away from a nuclear reactor. Similarly, for accelerators, you build an accelerator or you use an existing accelerator, and then you build your detectors, maybe close to it, and maybe another one far away. And that's limited by the size of our planet or wherever you want to build, um, build your uh, detectors. Energy ranges there depends on the energy range of the accelerator. And that is in the, in the order of 10 to the 3, 10 to the 4 MeV. So you see that you know, the, it's actually rather straightforward study. Also, it's interesting to see and to see this next, what kind of flavor of neutrinos and whether or not we can study neutrinos or antineutrinos uh, with other experiments is important. So let's go through this uh, and also explain a little bit of a history and how this all occurred. So the, the first question is, you know, what, what happens to the solar neutrinos? So uh, no, solar neutrinos are basically produced in the core of the sun together with light. It turns out that the light of the sun takes about 10,000 years to come out of the sun, while the neutrinos come out immediately. Um, so when first experiments tried to observe um, solar neutrinos, they had a theoretical estimate on how many neutrinos to expect, and they saw less. And so one explanation would have been, or could have been, or was, uh, maybe something happened at the core of the sun, and we just haven't seen it yet, because the light which comes out of the sun, um, you know, has a delay of up to 10,000 years. That didn't turn out to be the case. Um, so here's a spectrum of the neutrino energies and the specific sources of neutrinos uh, from the sun. In our nuclear physics discussion, we uh, will get to the point that we understand how the neutrino, uh, how the sun produces energy, and then some of this becomes more clear. The story to take away at this point is that there are certain, there's a, several processes within the sun producing neutrinos, and they all come with a characteristic energy distribution. Um, but the bottom line is, you know, you find MeV scale neutrinos from the sun. So there's a soup of electron neutrinos. Um, they start interacting with the sun and there's a little bit of a flavor evolution within when, when they go through the material of the sun. Um, but you know what you want to really do is you know, look for disappearance in detectors which are sensitive to electron neutrinos. And that has been done um, in a number of experiments, most famous maybe the Davis experiments, which the big tank of chlorine and in the interaction you were looking for finding argon in your detector and you just every now and then went in there and saw how much argon was actually produced 
And it turned out that those experiments, all of them, found a reduced number of um, neutrinos uh, reduced with respect to the theoretical expectation. So far, so good. Um, the assumption was that or there was no knowledge of neutrino oscillations or mixing at this time. So that needed to be explained. And one way to explain this, but it's not just using the charge interaction, which allows you to probe the flavor of the neutrino, but also lose the neutral, um, the neutral uh, scattering, um, which then allows you to, to measure the total number of neutrinos. And if you do this, this was done by the SNOW experiment, you find that the total number of neutrinos is in good agreement with the theoretical expectation. Hence, the neutrinos are not really lost. They're just more from one flavor into the next. So this was the first evidence for, um, for uh, solar neutrinos to be um, oscillating. Um, by now there's, you know, this first experiment was home stake. Um, by now there is a larger number of solar neutrino experiments and you see the long time of neutrino studies. <clears throat> um, different materials are being used, different energy thresholds being tested, different scale of the experiments and experiments become more sensitive the larger they are. And so this is can, some, something you can see from this table. The next source of neutrinos is the ones which are produced in the atmosphere. So they are produced in the case of pions and kaons, and you know while, while <clears throat> the cosmic rays interact with, with the atmosphere or the Earth's atmosphere. And so you find, for example, a pi plus decaying into a muon in a muon neutrino. And then the muon itself can decay into an electron, an electron neutrino and a muon antineutrino. So if you, for example, build the ratio of muon and anti-muon over electron, anti-electron neutrinos, you find it should be around two. Right, you have two neutrinos, muon neutrinos here and an electron neutrino. And also this wasn't really, um, really observed. And you can see here as a function of the cosine of the zenith of, you know, looking up upwards towards the atmosphere or downwards, you find that there is an effect of, of this kind of oscillation. So the actual measurement depends on the energy range. Um, and you can see that the, the muon neutrinos, muon-like neutrinos, they disappear. You see here in this very clear plot, the prediction without oscillation compared to the experimental results. So you see the, the muon neutrinos actually disappear. Moving on, accelerators can be used. And the big accelerator on the Earth are at CERN or at Fermilab. Um, the beam line at Fermilab is called uh, NUMI, Fermilab, Fermilab National Accelerator Laboratory, FNAL, um, or CERN, or in Japan. Those are the big sources of accelerator-driven neutrinos. And <clears throat> in results, there's then big detectors, typically a detector very close to the um, accelerator and one further away, the close one to probe the uh, total flux of the neutrino at the experiment, and then the one which is away in order to probe the effect of the neutrino oscillation, you know, in order to study appearance or disappearance. And again, here you see this is a long program, but it basically took off quite a bit in the 2000s and after. Uh, so a lot of neutrino physics happened in those years, a lot of information about the neutrino was gathered in those years. And again here, uh, this is from the T2K experiment. Uh, you see um, the, the comparison between unoscillated predictions and oscillated, um, you know, using some additional constraints about uh, your expectation of the total flux of the neutrinos and that compared to the data. And you see very clearly that the, uh, that the neutrinos oscillate, that there is evidence for oscillation. All right, the last source are reactor neutrinos. Uh, we will talk about nuclear physics starting from next week. Um, here, neutrinos are, you, are produced in nuclear fission of heavy isotopes, uh, mainly it's uranium and polonium. Um, the flux can be calculated in various ways, for example, by knowing the nuclear processes and the thermal, <coughs> thermal power produced in the reactor, or by just looking at how much fuel is being nuclear fuel is being uh, used by the reactor itself. 
what's being studied here is the anti um, anti electron tree the disappearance and you what you do here is you use this inverse bitter decay where you uh, have a collision or a scattering of a anti electron neutrino with a proton creating an electron a positron and a neutron and the, again there is a number of experiments basically whenever you have a uh, whenever you have a uh, a large neutrino experiment it can probe uh, surrounding nuclear reactors. There's many of them in France, in Japan, um, also in China, and they're being used in those experiments. Again, you see that this topic became really hot in the 2000s, and again, a lot of have, a lot has been there learned. So this plot here shows you as a function of the energy, uh, as the length over the energy, so kilometer over MeV, the oscillation, the survival probability, meaning that you can actually see directly the oscillation of the neutron. 